well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? This is the beginning and the end of the road. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Michael Kessler. Yeah, you are. However, there is no beginning and there is no end. There is only <laughs> only the road. the road. You know, a while back, we did this thing that served as an amazing blueprint mm-hmm. when we did M and 7. Mm-hmm. And it really was the beginning and the end of film noir. Yeah. It was it was probably before the beginning of film noir. Right. And, and after, after the, the end. end. Right. <laughs> it was uh one of the the best pieces of neo noir, you know, towards the end of that stuff, past the end of that stuff. Of course you can never really reach the end of something because there'll always be new waves of it and every couple decades things will just get recycled and we'll come up with new and exciting ways to do things. Mm-hmm. However, we repeated that again and it was fantastic. We did uh black maybe even beforehand, I don't know the order of these shows. Uh, Black Christmas and Behind the Mask. Right. And so that was a little bit different. That was slashers. That was, yeah, that was the birth and death of the slasher. So same kind of thing. Yep. A really great start to that. And then a a kind of a late turn, uh, taking the idea and doing something new and modern and exciting with it. Mm -hmm. Today, we have finally reached a point with road exploitation. Yeah. Where I'm pretty sure we've seen all road exploitation movies. Yeah, that's not true. But the, it's not. It's but definitely. It it's probably as much road exploitation as our audience ever needs to see. That is probably true. Until this time next year, mm-hmm. or this time later this year. This maybe. time in a couple weeks from now. Oh God. So we have some commentaries about film, commentaries about genres and movements and eras. Yeah, we are uh, we're covering two movies this week, and yeah. what are the fucking movies? We're gonna do Two Lane Blacktop and Rubber. Two Lane Blacktop, aside from being an excellent song, <laughs> is uh, is the older of the two, and yeah. Rubber is the newer of far the two. newer, far weirder. <laughs> yeah, also true. So we're gonna spoil both of these movies. We were we didn't say anything about Rubber. We said it's a movie about a tire. Mm-hmm. And Actually, that might have been a spoiler when you look at how many <laughs> things could really be spoiled in the movie Rubber. That's true. Now, I'm going to give an additional warning, which I uh, I realized somewhere in talking about Nine Inch Nails for 20 minutes uh, last year, that I can give these warnings out because we have chapters. Uh-huh. So if you haven't seen the movies, you don't want to be spoiled. Use the chapters. Skip around. Chapters are embedded in the song. You can go on iTunes or your iPod or whatever. You can find the chapters. There's a button in there somewhere. You'll find it. Use the help menu. It's great. Use it. You can also use the chapters to skip movies you care about, but don't ever care to hear us talk about. Right. So Rubber is going to be uh, for, I mean, all those people who love talking about filmmaking and uh, kind of slowly, and I mean painfully slowly, learning the craft of filmmaking yeah. with ourselves here. Uh, these little techniques and uh, these odd little ideas, rubber, uh, camera shit. That's what yeah. I'm getting to. There's yeah. going to be some camera shit in right. rubber. If you don't care about rubber, then you got a short week today. You can just <laughs> turn this podcast off halfway through and everything will be fine. If you do, this is probably going to be a gold mine because I really don't want to have the conversation rubber wants me to have. Yeah, Everybody else already did that. Yep. Right? That's been covered. Yeah. That's yeah. Find that somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But before we even get there, two lane blacktop. So the promise of the 60s, yeah, not quite paying off. We've, uh, we've been doing acid for 10 years, and we somehow... Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda have exploded. Somehow have not achieved world peace. Not sure why. And so I think we're in a place now, it's 1971, and we, uh, you know, the apathy has set in. Yeah. The, uh, the reality, I think, <laughs> is what it's called. Well, uh, it's certainly that, it's, too. It's the adulthood of the... Uh, the love generation. Yeah. That's... They finally come to the point in their lives where they have to make a living instead of making love in fields. Not that there's anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with it, but you need to be able naked. to support yourself. Yeah, they just realize, I think, uh, something most people are politically active when they're younger probably come to realize that having protests and marches really accomplishes little to nothing. Yep. And so we see an excellent, excellent example, a great product of that. Tulane Blacktop. Yeah. This is a movie that's about as uh, as heavy philosophically, existentially, mm-hmm. as any of these road movies ever get. Yeah. 
but in uh, quite a different direction than oh, we yeah, used to say. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, when we talk about road movies, what, what are the conversations? Well, usually you talk about how great the character is, how much you want to see them succeed, you know, the charisma of this one sure. man against all the odds and being fast and being a rebel and all this kind of... Yeah, counterculture, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's one man army kind of stuff. Ass kicking counterculture. Sure, and there's sweet motherfucking Dodge muscle cars, and it's just it's a it's a ride. Two lane blacktop. You have a car from the fifties. I think the car is actually filmed in black and white. I'm not they, sure what's happening. Yeah, the thing with this car is it 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 strips all the glamour out of what could be, you know, a white vintage Dodge sure. Challenger, and instead you get a fifty five Chevy. Right. It doesn't have a racing stripe. It doesn't have. It doesn't heat. have doesn't have anything painted on the yeah. hood. Uh, this is a bullshit car. It's still a badass car. Yeah, it is. It's a famous car but from a famous to, road sportation. They have to earn movie. it. They have to earn yeah. the cool car. And this isn't the road either. I mean, it's not the open road. It's, uh, it's just the regular type road. Yeah, regular type road with two lanes. Do you remember, we're watching Easy Rider. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the way in which I mocked Easy Rider at the time we were talking about it? Uh, not exactly. I believe I, I called block it, out uh, <laughs> all na naysaying when it comes to Easy Rider. Well, I loved Easy Rider. Don't get me wrong. I love every movie that we ever do, ever, forever. However, I believe I made fun of it as Dennis Hopper's uh, what is slideshow Midwest vacation or something. Yeah, okay. I could see that. Uh, and I did so because a lot of it was chewing up scenery. Mm -hmm. And it was great. That's what Easy Rider yeah. is really good at. It's showcasing the... Um, Summer of Love. It's saying, look at all this great scenery. We're on bikes. That's what that movie was about. We're trying to spread our fucking wings here. Freedom, America, LSD. That's, that was going on in this film. This, I mean, we rarely even see where they're driving. Yeah. I, I have no idea where I think, they are. I think, I think the one thing that, we've, that we almost never see in this film is a smile. Sure, sure that too, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's no smiling. There's no sightseeing. There's no destination. This is nobody's vacation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically a group of people who have settled into very much just being their role. I mean, we get it with the character names, right? The character names for the film are the driver, the mechanic, the girl, and GTO. The driver drives, the mechanic does mechanical work, the girl has a vagina, and GTO drives a GTO. Yeah. These characters have just become their roles. They don't have personalities outside of their roles, which is why the driver and the mechanic constantly talk to each other in a language no one else understands, <laughs> sure, and sure. they totally ignore the fact that nobody else cares. Yeah, right. And no one else cares. You know, they go from location to location, and you can't even count on the extras right. to be exciting. Except for Harry Dean Stanton, but apparently GTO's not into that. Not into it at all. GTO's about the most exciting we get of these <laughs> characters. And, you know, I want to come back to him in a minute, but... Uh, so, as we're watching this movie, we're not focusing on the, uh, the outside much, but when we do see it, there's nothing to look at. Fields. And they stop at these diners, these mm -hmm. uh, truck stop places... But we see that in other movies. This sure. is not the tension-filled truck stop from Duel. It's not. That's you right. Know, this is not the Easy Rider uh, kind of diner. I mean, we're not in the places we care about. We're in places filled with basically more boring people. Yeah, like or characters. no people, if or there no are people. any people at all. Sure. We don't even notice when yeah. there are. There's, I mean, there's the one part that always strikes me as very strange is when they go to the mechanic shop, right? Because GTO needs to get a new part for his car and they don't have it. So they go to this garage and they stay there for what could be two or three days with nobody around. They almost don't talk to each other. They're just kind of sitting and waiting for this garage to open completely. Just eventually, you know, they see some children outside and the driver just goes, Oh, it must be Saturday. How much bleaker could your existence be? <laughs> If your existence was any more bleak, it would be exciting. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, true. that's the that's the painful part of this is that it's so mediocre that it's it's dead in the middle. There is there's nothing to feel on either side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I might use a word like dull. I might use a word like confined. I think yeah. is great. You know what it really comes down to is uninteresting. Yeah, that is the word I would use to describe every element of the characters of what they're doing, of how mm -hmm. they feel, about how sure. people feel about them. Right. And uh, surprisingly, 
after we talk about the adventures of these road exploitation movies, mm-hmm. it sounds like uninteresting would mean the worst road exploitation right. movie ever. But it's more like amazingly yeah. uninteresting. Yeah, it's really good. It's fucking amazing. I love it. We may read into some of these road exploitation movies a bit too Probably much. Probably way too much. I don't know if we do. A lot of times it's fast cars. Yeah, good time. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, we're not reading into them a ton. There's a lot more. I think if you talk to people from the 70s yeah. uh, and from the 60s who remember these movies, they read into them a lot more. But we kind of talk about the culture of the time and whatever. But we could be guilty of that. I don't right. know. This movie is uh, everything it does, it sets out to do. Mm-hmm. None of this is an accident. You know that by the characters' names, but you know that by the film's ending. Yeah. You know that by the meticulous way it goes through and makes sure to brush out the color and detail from every aspect right. of everything. Yep. It doesn't accidentally leave one interesting thing anywhere because it's it's got a message. It's out to yeah. prove a fucking point. Well, I mean, it does leave one interesting thing, and he's driving the... Uh super sports car from bakersfield possibly sure. from bakersfield honestly i don't know where the fuck he came from war notes yeah is the only interesting human being <laughs> you know it could be the car right yeah the car is yellow honestly so i prefer the chevy over the gto in this movie but uh, the real question is which of the ever-changing sweaters do you prefer uh, he had like a maroon number with like a bluish shirt that i dug far before people were celebrating the mysterious uh background and origin story of Heath Ledger's Joker, mm-hmm. we were playing the exact same game <laughs> with Warren fucking Oates. Yeah. GTO, what is his story? The, you know, throughout the movie, he people don't even ask him where he came from, what's going no, on. He volunteers. He always information. volunteers information. Yeah. It always changes. At first, he just says that he wanted to, he was test what testing jets sure. and decided to buy a car. And then he says he wins it in Las Vegas and then he says he's in a race sponsored by a Detroit car company. He eventually says he wins it from the guys that he's racing against. Right. I mean, the story changes. He's driving to Florida to help his mom redecorate her house. Honestly, I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know what his backstory is, but he does claim to have been a vagrant for a very long time. My only idea is con man. Yeah. I mean, either that or really the spirit of the road. The spirit of the road. Wow. Metaphorical Michael Kester. He also changes passengers all yeah, the time. he does. He has constantly got new people in <laughs> his car. There were a lot of hitchhikers in the late 60s and early 70s. They're all terrible, too. Yeah. None of these are people you want to spend a car ride with. I think the best he really gets mm-hmm. is the depressing old woman that's, and yeah. the daughter. Yeah. I mean, that's really, that's the only one that isn't kind of psychotic or, you know, hitting on him, <laughs> uh, who is, uh, you know, otherwise uninvited yeah. company, is the depressing one. The person who really fits in with all the other characters in the yeah, movie should not be a surprise true. to us. So I've talked a lot about how these people are uninteresting mm-hmm. and what have you. And I want to talk about why that is. But I, I think rather than me stumbling over a lot of this, if you could talk a little bit about me and Bobby McGee, that okay. would probably summarize it yeah, better than I, I ever I think could. it really does. So I don't know anyone named Bobby McGee, by yeah. the way. I literally mean the song titled yeah. Me and Bobby McGee. So there's a song, uh, it plays it on the GTO's car when they're at the gas station. Mm-hmm. It's Me and Bobby McGee by Chris Christopherson. Mm-hmm. And I fucking love Chris Christopherson. Sure. I absolutely love Chris Christopherson. I like him as an actor. I like him as a musician. I like him as Barbara Streisand's ex-husband. And this is from his first record. He was, uh, he's got this really great backstory. Essentially, he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, came home from the war, met with the same kind of bullshit that Vietnam guys were met with. He ended up wanting to write songs, became an alcoholic, homeless, poor, landed his helicopter at Johnny Cash's house and showed him a song, became a semi-successful folk musician. But he wrote this song called Me and Bobby McGee, later made popular by Janis Joplin. And the chorus is pretty much the thesis of this film. Sure. Which is, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing ain't worth nothing, but it's free. This is the movie. This is the characters' lives. This is everything this film (laughs) is saying. Not just about itself, but probably about the genre, too. Yeah. It's not just talking about the culture. It's, uh, It's kind of giving its own spin on what, up to this point, 
have been movies that are all about celebration. It's true, because a lot of the other road exploitation movies are people gunning it, going fast, high octane. Right. You know, we all know how road exploitation movies end. Sure. And it's really it's about how they don't have anything left to lose. It's them, the car, and the road. That's freedom, but at the same time, when they die, it's not like they weren't expecting it. Live fast, die young. It's just fucking punk rock. It's just glamour. And so here, the most glamorous thing between these people are the their favorite engines. Yeah. You know, you mentioned this type of dialogue they have. It's all about cars. Mm -hmm. It is their own language. All they fucking talk about is how to make their car just a tiny bit faster. They have not a goal or ambition in the world. They don't care about other people. Mm -hmm. They're just wondering how to optimize their vehicle. And they run out of money. And instead of getting really upset over the fact that they don't have money, they just kind of say to themselves, well, we're out of money. We need to win a race. And then they win a race and they get some money. And then they say we have $50 and then $300 racing bread. In the meantime, they're nearly forgetting about the girl. They leave mm -hmm. her in the rain. She's right. that important to them. <laughs> uh, she has no luck with either of them. Yeah. I'm not even sure what she's looking for. I think, she she's, looking, to, I think she's looking for Easy Rider America. She wants it, but she doesn't want it that bad. Yeah. You know, she wastes a lot of time hanging out with these two. Mm -hmm. She tries hanging out with GTO. That doesn't really do anything for her. Eventually, she rides off with some guy on a bike. She wants something better, but she just doesn't want it that hard. She mm -hmm. has none of her own ambitions. She's hoping to find someone else with yep. greater ambitions. But she's the one who compares their life to cicadas. Yeah. I mean, she talks about, you know, they're both talking about uh, these bugs. They're, they spend seven years in the ground. They're doing nothing important. They barely continue their own fucking existence. Right. Once every seven years, they wake up from a nap. Grow some wings, fuck and die. And it becomes really clear to both of them that this is all they're doing. Yeah. They hesitate for a moment as if this is going to be a great awakening for them. Uh -huh. And in a movie that wasn't from the 70s, right. this might be. The <laughs> characters might realize this is their carpe diem moment. They have to fucking do something with themselves. But it's a movie from the 70s. So apathy just kicks right back in. Yep. And it is nothing. Now, this isn't to say by the 70s, these road exploitation movies were gone. Right. Because, I mean, you know, Vanishing Point was the very same year. Mm -hmm. I think Vanishing Point was just looking back to the previous decade. It's still in the mindset sure. of 60s rebellion. You know, if you compare these guys' adventure to something like Smokey and the Bandit, which is admittedly only on the fringe of road exploitation. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about that being uh, the most mainstream road uh -huh. exploitation. But that is a fucking adventure yeah, around it is. every turn. You know, there's a purpose for them being on the road, but I have a feeling even if they were on the road for no reason, they would still be getting into lots of trouble. Uh -huh. I mean, that's the, that's the fucking point of Smokey and the Bandit, yep. right? But in a way, that's, that feels furthest from a pure American road right. film. I would make the argument that Tulane Blacktop, for as pointed and uh, oppressive of the genre as it is, may be the pure American road film. It's probably true. This may be, uh, this is a film where the characters have no history, mm -hmm. they have no destination. And they have no future, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, there's places they propose to drive. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe we should go here. Maybe we should go there. But no one actually cares enough about where they're going to make right. that decision. And eventually, they just have to put their foot on the gas and they wind up somewhere. They are the present. They yep. are... 1971 mm -hmm. people talk about this uh you know as a, a route 66 uh what do they call it time capsule kind yeah. of film right mm -hmm. and that's true not just because of that pre-interstate kind of thing but also that these characters are in the moment not just throughout the film but throughout every instance of the film yeah all they care about is what is happening right now and maybe their immediate future they are the present and that's why the ending you know, it feels like every time one of these movies comes up, I say something to the effect of this is the coolest ending right. of all road exploitation yeah. films. Yeah. Which one is not true because they're all the same fucking ending. That's true. And yep. two is not true because only one is actually the best. Uh -huh. But uh, you couldn't get more perfect. If the movie puts out a thesis, as you're claiming it does, uh -huh. then this is a pretty beautiful pointed end. Yeah, it is. That thesis basically we have the driver who's alone mechanic is gone mm. the girl is gone gto is gone everybody bailed yeah and he's in a race looks over the dashboard 
and melts the film. <laughs> right. The movie melts in uh, in something that looks like it's out of a Tarantino Rodriguez yeah. joint. Yeah. Uh, perhaps one in particular. Yep. It's uh, an incredibly gimmicky ending. And one that's strange for 1971 and a film that's as dry and existential yeah. as it is. It uh, it leaves you thinking, well, what the fuck was that yeah. about? But it forces you in case uh, up to this point you have been oblivious to, I don't know how many times I need to say words like mundane and uninteresting. Yeah. But if you weren't aware that's what was happening and you kept waiting for the plot to show up. Sure. This was the, uh, this was the very moment where the film is saying... No, this is all you got. You might yep. want to go back and review. Yep. This is it. This is all that there is. The uh, the ending says that both of the film and of what the film is conveying. Yep. The film is physically, we are out of film. We have uh-huh. no other adventure for you. Yeah. And at the same time conveying, this is all they are making of their lives. Yes. So last week when we talked about Happy Go Lucky, uh-huh. we considered what it might be like to live your life like that protagonist. Yeah. And if there was anything wrong with that. Uh-huh. And it seems as if Tulane Blacktop is begging the same question. Yeah, but it's with a completely different answer. Do you think the movie is criticizing this lifestyle then? I the think, movie's not just asking you the I don't question. know if it's criticizing it as much as it's trying to actualize the lifestyle. Sure. It's trying to it's trying to actualize if you live your life racing cars really fast, you're going to become the type of person who races cars all the time and no one wants to talk to. Sure, without ever showing the alternative, it feels like it's urging you to get out of your garage. Well, it's just saying that cars are not enough. For a life. You might need to add people to that yeah, equation. Possibly. And perhaps not just people who also want to... Not people who are mutually ignoring each yeah. other while in a car. Right. That's you, not quite enough. You need to add people with names to your life. I think the movie wants to make sure that when you're on your roadside adventure and you meet the naked girl on the bike, that you get out of your car and stay out of your car for a while. Mm-hmm. I saw Rubber at the music box. Uh-huh. And I have a little story for you. Okay. I uh, I ran into a mutual friend of ours there. Uh huh. Here's the thing, man. <laughs> I've hesitated in a lot of opportunities where I really should bring it up, but it's so eye rolling. So we've covered the Music Box Massacre in the past. You know yeah. who I'm talking about. Sci-Fi Spectacular <laughs> takes place in the same place as the Music Box Massacre, and that's which where, is where I saw Robert. Right. Sure. Um. So it should be noted that the Sci-Fi Spectacular is emceed by the same jolly sure. fellow who emcees the uh the uh music box massacre and, and i have a feeling talked about previously yeah and i have a feeling that you're about to tell me about some uh fantastic antics well look i've been uh dodging the music mm-hmm. box massacre i just i just can't <laughs> i can't tolerate it man but i went i only share this because this is an amazing story uh-huh. and if i wasn't making my point earlier let yeah. me articulate it a little bit now that music boxes have transpired but uh, I go to see this movie. Now, if you haven't seen Rubber, again, for the cheaters, yep. this is a movie about a tire. It kind of kills people or something. It's a tire that becomes sentient, blows stuff up, and falls in love. Now, this is, a, this is a, definitely a gimmick movie, the oh, kind yeah. of thing that is popular because even mainstream audiences look at it and go, no way, guess what this is about. Yeah, exactly. And you really enjoy telling your friends what this movie's about sure. and watching the reaction. That's what it's all about. Yeah, glad we're on the same page there. So I get to this movie, and the uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, the guy. All right, so the guy who emceed the the other shows is there, <laughs> and before the movie begins, and let me just say, you know, I love the marathon format. I go to these movies. Sci Fi Spectacular was you know, twelve hours of movies or something. It's usually pretty great movies, and um, and I like to go there with some people and see these different movies and you know, get out and do a film thing. Music Box is a cool theater. We've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. So I've been watching a couple movies, and this MC is there, and he's doing the usual, you know, stupid MC things he does. He talks between the different movies and painfully tries to auction stuff out. You know, he does the auctions by starting at a high number and going lower and lower until someone in the audience agrees to buy whatever he's peddling. It's it's called guilt (sighs) auction. I know, and I feel so bad for the charity. Anyways, before Rubber starts... Rather than just doing a minute or two of there's stuff in the lobby, go to our MySpace, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. He brings out a tire on stage. A tire. Let's be (laughs) let's be clear. This is a tire. This is not a prop from the film. The director is not here. 
they're literally, they just have a print of the movie they're about to show. He brings out a tire on stage, props it in a chair, and proceeds to conduct an interview with the tire. Huh. This would be bad enough if this was uh, some brief stick I had to put up with, and the gag is that it's just a fucking tire, and it, it's a little bit different, whatever, maybe that would have been cool. But they also got a voice for the tire. Oh my god. So they proceed to have an interview with this tire where somebody off stage does a voice and he asks questions. And the tire can only respond by making tire related puns. Oh my god. It was possibly the worst seven and a half minutes of my life. That's awful. I don't know how I survived long enough to do this show. I don't know how I was able to watch this film with uh-huh. fresh eyes and not want to kill myself. It was it was possibly the worst thing of all time. I'm sorry. I'm you, voting it new worst thing of all time. I'm sorry that you had to do that. Not the worst thing of all time is the movie, Robert. That's true. So let's actually talk about this movie okay. a little bit. So before, I know you want to get into a bunch of technical stuff. Yeah, sure. And I'm going to let you dive into that as, Not a problem. as much as you want to. But before we do that, I just want to talk about what you talked about, the high concept aspect sure. of rubber. How fucking cool <laughs> is it? To take something, uh, t- honestly, if you told me to pick five things that I would like to see a movie sure. where they turn sentient, a tire wouldn't make my top fifty. <laughs> no, not I wouldn't at even. All. I don't even think of a tire as a thing. Right, it's a part of a car. Yeah, it's not its own thing. Yeah, and this movie has a stupid tire. Get up and roll around, <laughs> blow shit up, kill people, just wobble, drink some water the whole time. Mm. I am glued to <laughs> sure. just watching sure. a wheel. You know, what's funny is it's the dullest parts of the yeah, movie that you're the most right. glued to. I just wanted to watch the tire in its natural environment <laughs> sure. for an hour and a half. It didn't need to end up in civilization. They didn't need to do anything to make me feel like there was a higher concept sure. with the meta stuff. I was so on board watching a tire kill bunny. It is amazing what they uh, they managed to do with this. And, you know, it's been pointed out before that Christine is a movie where a car does this. Mm -hmm. There's really no reason you can't extend that to a tire. Mm -hmm. It just takes some creative thinking. So when you say meta, I mean, this is sort of, it's almost a commentary on commentaries. Yeah. The one piece that I think is about as sharp as it ever gets, and it's pretty great. As the movie opens... There's a bunch of chairs. Yeah. They knock down the chairs one by one, uh-huh. which is an exercise in the thing they're about to demonstrate. Right. And it's, uh, it's great to wonder how they're going to do this movie. You know, it's about a tire. You're waiting to get the tire stuff right away. And instead, a guy drives over a bunch of these chairs, gets out of the trunk, performs something that borders on an Old Spice commercial, yep. switching out some water for his sunglasses, and then proceeds to talk directly to the audience. Uh-huh who, you know, is not behind the fourth wall, but rather slightly in front of the fourth wall beyond us in right. a place we can't see. There's a <laughs> physical audience he's talking to. And he actually gives what's a pretty great speech yep. about suspension of disbelief, uh, or more particularly the not important, the don't ask, uh-huh. right? So that subsection of suspension of disbelief, the sort sure. of bear or no bear, right. we don't talk about this, that's not what this is really about, yeah. let's not yeah, be worried sure. here. The what, it basically, you know, what's outside of the scope of what we're dealing with. Thank you. That's exactly it. He sets up the scope of the film. He's establishing some expectations right away. Or tearing them down. Much better. And what I like is that this conversation works in a couple ways. Now, the conversation itself may be necessary for a more mainstream audience, who, let's face it, some people will come to this film and expect you to explain why the tire is uh, is awake and yeah. killing people and has a mind of its yeah. own. Which is, honestly, that's a real shame because that's just something that if you go see the movie, you just have to accept. But I do give the film props for at least acknowledging that there are going to be some whiny, cranky people watching the movie. And it could have done that with a one-liner throwaway... Whatever device? Whatever device. It could have done that. And it didn't. Instead, it gives this dialogue, which says, hey, relax a bit. But it also gives examples from movies, movies you and I know, movies the listeners of of this fucking awful podcast know. Mm -hmm. It talks about these movies, and it gives bad examples. (laughs) So if you know what it's, if you know the movies that it's citing and you've seen them all, you're probably fairly comfortable already with this. And so those examples aren't really for the people who are expecting the answer. They're for the people who don't need this conversation. Right. So instead, they're almost a series of insight jokes. 
Yeah, really, they are. It's it mentions ET, which is probably the most valid one. Uh huh. But it later goes on to talk about, uh, I guess, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre one. Yeah, is probably the most valid one. Yeah, the stupid why doesn't Jack Bauer, you know, use the bathroom in twenty four uh-huh. question. Why is the fat guy always fat and lost? And why doesn't yeah. the doctor shave his beard? Yeah. Those questions. The dumb questions where idiosyncratic people who want to find a problem with stuff go in and take them out. But he kind of rounds off this list with the pianist. Yeah. I mean, why does this guy have to hide if he's such a good piano yeah. <laughs> player? As if he hasn't seen the fucking movie mm-hmm. himself or is one of the people he was addressing in the first uh, section right. of this conversation. And then is made fun of by the guy in the car for explaining this shit, yep. which is also another section of the audience yep. who is uh, thinking, I don't care about Metacrap, show me a tire, kill yeah. people. I'm part of that audience. And directly after that, we get a couple things from, uh, from the moviegoers, which also I think are the most priceless things right in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's boring already. <laughs> that got such a huge laugh when I was yeah. in the theater because we're all sitting there waiting. What's going on? Yep. What are they looking at? Where is the fucking tire? What's going to happen in this movie? And it's just such a, it was a, a fucking icebreaker. It was yeah. great. And then we see the tire kill people. Now, we could talk about more of the meta stuff. Yeah. And the tires go into Hollywood. Sure. And what this movie's yeah. at the heart really about. Well, what it's, what it's asking. I think what it's about is a killer tire. Okay. I, I agree with you. Most of the time when a film asks a question, we'll go ahead. And we'll, sure. We'll take we just the did it with the last one. And we'll do it again in the future. Uh-huh. However, this time there is something much more amazing that I am passionate about going yeah. on in this film. Yeah. And the questions are just, they don't really measure up to... They certainly don't. <laughs> to what's really inspiring yeah. to me at yeah. this point. This is a movie made by, uh, I'm going to call him Mr. Oizo. That's his uh, French techno name oh right? okay but so he's a it's the same guy the director has a has a yeah, code name he does have a code name well he's a techno musician he's done a couple other films no. some short films he has a code videos. name we, we've here to for referring to it call as it. a code name okay that's fine code name so he is the writer the director the cinematographer probably the camera operator and the editor the important jobs to this film all rest upon this one man. Code name Oizo. And the score is good. I, it's particularly at the end that I think the score yeah, is really a, great. Yeah, there's kind of a weird music video at the end. Yeah, there is. Yeah, so you start to see that background, right? Yeah. It starts to make a little more sense. It gives it some character. It's really synthy. It's diverse throughout the movie. Yeah. Different parts call for different things. And it's, it's always great. But I think as far as the video stuff goes, this movie falls under that great heading of... I am super pissed I didn't make this. Yeah. You know those movies? Oh, yeah. They come around once in a while. Sure. And they, for me, it, they usually have cars. Sometimes a movie sets out to do a simple thing. It does it extremely well, and it looks like it takes a bare minimum amount of effort. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I see the components quite clearly that a, a movie has made. You know, yeah. you can listen to a song that was made with 32 different tracks and never have any idea the layers of it. And you can listen to a song... That was recorded live by three guys. You can listen to the fucking White Stripes, right? Right. And you can go, well, there's drums, and there's a guitar, and a guy singing. I know all three of those components. Mm -hmm. I can make this. Yeah, right. (laughs) I could produce something like this. And part of, you know, the beauty of being great at a craft is you make it look easier than it is. Sure. But when you can identify the components like that, it's fucking magic. And you're almost angry. You're Mm -hmm. a little bit pissed. Yep. This is, I think, a film for directors. I feel like this is, uh, this is a movie that boldly proclaims not having a great complex story is no longer an excuse to not make yeah. a movie. I sit here and I think, eh, I could use a camera and I could put some stuff together, but I'm just not a very good writer. Yeah. I just, what, what story do I have to tell? In five seconds, you could say, I don't know, how about a tire? It kills people, runs over things, and then they <laughs> shoot it. What, done, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, you're it. done. And I don't want to short sell the writing here. Obviously, there's a whole layer we're not even talking about mm-hmm. with the, the stuff that's commenting on itself. Right. And uh, there's also a lot of writing that needs to be in fleshing out the concept for an hour that needs to be in pacing your clever moments. So you kind of know, okay, well, what is the tire's journey? Where does it go? How do we keep an audience amused with this tire? So we have to set up these gags. But that starts to get closer once again to something I feel like I could do. I could think of a handful of gags and paste them out in a way that I feel like would entertain people. You start small, you sure. work your way up, sure. you go big. So this, uh, so at that point, when we narrow down those components, the movie becomes pure technical imagination. It becomes if the filmmakers do their job well on a technical level, 
if they can create beautiful art in all other aspects, mm-hmm. beautiful, of, beautiful head explosions. And right. Such. Thank you. Exactly that. If they can really bring their Tom Savini a game, yeah, then a well written drama is not required here. No, you need you need a tire. You need a tire. You need the right music. You need really clever Daylight. editing. <laughs> you need to be clever in a couple good places. Sure. You need to really have your craft honed down in a couple key places. But you don't need a huge crew. You don't need a huge budget. You don't need the things that are outside the reach of everybody listening to this fucking show. And I think the hardest thing they excel at is the special effects yeah. and the, uh, the sort of violence. You know, you have the rabbit that explodes, yep. which is a great one. You have the heads that explode. And I mean, to be honest with you, I never get tired of seeing heads burst. Yeah. When the heads explode in this movie, they seem to be, get better and better one They after do. They another. really do. I mean, I think it culminates with that, uh, that cop sitting in the car. Absolutely. That is uh, far and away the best one. Yeah. It's, uh, it I mean, it splits up the back of his head. Yeah, I know it's brutal and it's great. And they're filled with gore. Uh, there is nothing shy about this movie except the lack of nudity, which I am going to, you know, just check a point off yeah. for that. But the heads are full of bloody, disgusting, awful, and it stains your hotel carpet and it gets fucking everywhere and it's meaty and pulpy. It ruins the supermarket. It's great. And this is a, this is a chance I think for us to talk about composites. Uh huh. So walk me through a little bit. Are we seeing CGI here? Is this puppets? What the fuck is going on? Well, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And okay. that's, that's our fault. My fault, <laughs> really. For, I'll take credit for that, too. For, it can be our fault. For claiming that the, uh, the other option to CGI is puppets. And while that's, that's the other really simple explanation, it's the one you can see the easiest. Right. There are other techniques that technically aren't cheating, sure. but are still digital. Usually to do... It, so, for example, a composite, great example, you shoot everything that you see. Right. Everything that you see on the screen, you're actually doing, you're actually shooting it, you're not adding it in later, you're just compiling it digitally in such a way so that, for example, you will shoot... You know, you shoot a person up until their head explodes and then you shoot the head explosion Mm -hmm. and you kind of just cut it so that the head explosion comes in at the right spot at the right place in the frame and you line the two different reels up. I mean, you're not using film. I don't know what to call it in digital world, but you still, I think just video. Yeah, you line that you line the video up so that everything is still looking right when the head blows up and then it looks like the head's blowing up. Because you filmed it blowing up. Right. So it seems like it works in practical reality. Sure. It's not, oh, uh, the CG particles look weird. And yeah. You can tell the lighting and the, the detail isn't uh-huh. there and the footage gets strange. And, and the part, part of it's moving for some reason. Yeah, right. So I think the most basic level of a composite is when you look at old monster movies. Yeah. Or you look at a transformation and there's clearly one scene and maybe it fades into another scene, you know, of, uh-huh. of the wolfman transforming something sure. to that effect. Or you have uh, someone turn invisible, right? Yeah. So you're filming them, and then you pause the camera, you stop yep. the camera, they walk out of the frame, and then you turn the camera back on. And sometimes you notice the light kind of jump, yeah. or the exposure is a little different, or something has changed a little bit. You can spot that. Mm-hmm. But now with the simple technology that basically anyone could get yeah. on a, you know, if you've bought a computer in the last five years, you can not only line these things up and make them match correctly, but you don't even have to choose one frame or the other frame. Mm -hmm. You could take two full takes. This is kind of how green screen is done. You shoot one take on green screen. You shoot another take that's your plate. It's your background. And then you delete the green screen, leaving a hole in your photo, in your film. And what's behind the hole is the plate. Yeah. You could do the same thing with an effect. So we talked about that uh, with some of the Rodriguez stuff. You know, you shoot both of these things, like you said, you cut out the areas you want to change. So maybe you leave that person's body twitching there Mm -hmm. and they act out that whole scene. But halfway through, you can digitally remove their head and replace it with a, you know, static kind of shot you did of just a broken head on the floor. Yeah. And by being very selective in how you remove the head Mm -hmm. and at what points you sort of make those trims, you can get away with something that looks like it really happened and it's cheap and fairly simple to do. So at that point, you know, when I'm looking at this movie, and I'm saying, oh, I see the elements, I could almost do this. Uh, I mean to say that really without ego, because yeah. I could not have made this movie. 
I got to come really close to making a crappy well, version could, of you this. You could, you can make the movie now having seen the movie, right? but well, you yeah. couldn't have made it first. And given infinite creativity, yeah. there are distinct parts where you can look at it and know what they're doing, but not how they're accomplishing right. it. Right. So a lot of the tire effects, a lot you can probably do by literally rolling a tire sure. and picking out where you edit it very yep. carefully. In the way they line up some of these effects and get them to work out beautifully, people are just doing magic tricks. Mm-hmm. And as a magician, you could probably watch that and know several possible ways you could do the trick. Right. But maybe not know the exact technique or what about the performance is making it so special, is giving it so much authenticity. Mm-hmm. I had one last thing I wanted to talk about that gets really technical. And uh, we'll see you next time. Use chapters, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> but I've been waiting for this for so long. And I believe this may be the first movie I've seen where this is true. This is filmed on a DSLR. Now, I've talked about DSLRs before. Mm-hmm. We talked about RED cameras a bit. It's on some of the Soderbergh stuff. We've mentioned it here and there. Uh, RED is shooting now on... Uh, they're these special kind of cameras. They shoot on video instead of... They shoot digitally. Yeah. They shoot to a file, to a hard drive, yeah. rather than shooting to film. They're cheap. They're light. They're fast. They're great in uh, you know, low lighting situations. Then there's DSLRs, which aren't made for filmmaking. They're photography cameras. When you see a uh, billboard of a, you know, a really nice sports car. Mm-hmm. It was probably shot on an extremely high-end DSLR camera. These are technically consumer uh, cameras. They're the kind of cameras you could buy off Amazon, right? Right. The camera this was shot on is called a Canon 5D Mark II. It's sort of the gold standard, and Nikon people are already sending me angry emails. <laughs> Settle down. It's fine. Uh, it's kind of the gold standard for a high-end camera. Yeah, you know, it's one of the. It's a camera that people love and adore and use for high end photography. As a side effect, one cute, cool little thing it can do, especially at the time, which was such a non feature, is it shot video too. It happened to shoot some video, uh-huh. and through technical add ons they release for free, firmware updates, they have allowed you to manipulate the settings in such a way that you can use this as a serious, no fucking around film camera as a movie-making piece of technology. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of devices have come out uh, since this, but this is exciting for me. The same camera I use to to shoot your stuff is the lower level, you know, in this Canon line um, that I use two of them, a T1i and a T2i for the Glitter Mouse video. Uh And uh, now I'm using a T3i, which is just kind of the last year's update to sort of the $1,000 range camera Uh uh-huh this camera is about 2500 bucks which is the cheapest fucking thing anyone has ever used to film right ever in the history of anything and the director also used the really cheap canon lenses you know he's spoken out against some of these higher price sometimes you pay a thousand dollars for a lens sure uh you know one of the lenses for this t3i was 1200 bucks 1300 bucks um the one that i like the most was 120 dollars this tiny little fucking thing it's great and then, you know, I got a, a wide angle lens, I think was $400. So when you're looking at this entire kit, you're still talking about less than five grand for several lenses. Mm-hmm. You could effectively, if you want, shoot a movie with this $800 camera body and this $120 lens. They shot this movie probably using uh, about $3,500 worth of camera body and lenses. Mm-hmm. And that's amazing to me. That puts so much power in the hand of the consumer. And I have to say, as much as I just said previously, I don't want to have any ego about any of this. If I could applaud myself for one tiny thing, I'm actually really proud of this. I saw this movie, and I actually had suspicions that it was shot on a Canon DSLR camera. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why. I think it's probably the shallow depth of field that gave it away, or uh, something about the difficulty kind of holding focus while they're moving around. Yeah, It just seemed like a lot of the stuff I'd seen from these cameras. Right. I remember us starting the show four fucking years ago Mm -hmm. and not knowing anything about uh filmmaking right and there i was sitting in a theater going huh i bet that was shot on a canon 5d (laughs) that's a very strange place to find myself in so there's a lot of weird technical things to try and get over uh little hurdles when you're shooting video on these things because they're not made for video Mm -hmm. they're made to shoot single photos so they tend to overheat if you use them for too long Uh, A lot of them can't film for longer than, you know, 12 minutes or whatever. So you can't do really, really long takes. Although a lot of times when you're putting together a movie, you're I mean, no scene in this movie is longer than a a minute. You know what I mean? Right. And then they also don't come with uh, follow focus. A, um, 
I mean, I, a lot of cameras don't. That's something you buy in a rig. But when you're operating a camera, you have that shallow depth of field, a very slim amount of things that are in focus, mm -hmm. and an object moves closer or further away from you, you have to change where your focal point is as that thing is moving. You're, uh, if you've ever used a camera, you, you've shot a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. You shoot something, it has autofocus, it stays in focus right. as long as you shoot it. Yep. You worry about what the fuck is going on in front of the camera, mm -hmm. everything stays in focus, your job's done for you. Yep. You start using a shallow depth of field and suddenly everything is not in focus. <laughs> and so your camera doesn't know where your subject is or what you want to focus on. Do you want to focus on the tire or the shit in the background? Who knows? So you physically have to turn your lens to change how far back that point of focus is. And if you're running around chasing a fucking tire around, that can be really hard. So, you know, in Hollywood, they would have um, a focus puller, a first AC, a camera assistant, basically. Mm -hmm. So somebody kind of operates the camera, maybe composes the shots, operates the monitor, carries the equipment. You know, these are all different jobs. One person's job, all they do if they're a focus puller is make sure that the subject is in focus. And they move this little thing called a follow focus around. Uh, it's kind of a little crank that you can attach that will make it easy to shift your focus from one spot to another. And that's your whole job on a movie. You were the follow focus operator. <laughs> I want to give people enough information that they can look this stuff up. Uh -huh. They're called DSLR cameras. I gave you the name of a couple. You can find guides to DSLR filmmaking. We will probably never have more than this amount of how to make movie talk on any yep. particular show. Because honestly, that's not really what the show is about. Right. It's what it is about for us. Right. But unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, we, we're interested in some of that. We're, we're imparting knowledge that we don't actually yeah. have any. Well, that we don't have any knowledge of. That's, yeah, we're, that's what it is. Yeah. We're imparting our lack of knowledge. Right. So there are better places that, honestly, I, I mean that sincerely, there are far better places you can find out about this stuff. But look up guides on DSLR filmmaking. Find out what makes them different from normal cameras. This is stuff you could be doing in your backyard pretty much right now. Yep. I mean, I know I said these things cost, you know, for $1,000, you could buy a really good solid kit that you could basically show your movie in a theater. Mm -hmm. If you don't have $1,000, you can probably rent one of these for a weekend for 100 bucks. Yep. You could fucking convince somebody on Craigslist to loan you one of these things. And you could start making movies. How fucking cool is that? That's really fucking cool, actually. And if you do do that, send us send us a link to uh, so we can steal it. Um, yeah, put your thing on the internet. Yeah, that would we'll be double feature show instead. at gmail dot com. Um, if you forget that email address, you can go to double feature show dot com. And Beautiful contact us page. Yep, look at that fancy little form on there. <laughs> Fill it out. Write things in it. We have um, two movies that are going to be in the territory that I excused us from talking about uh -huh. uh, on the show today, or at least uh, during Rubber. Yep. We're talking about really heavy stuff in fiction, some bizarre movies, the type of movies you watch and you walk out of the movie and say, what the fuck just yeah. happened? Those are going to be the, the two movies. We're basically going to be celebrating what the fuck <laughs> yeah. uh, next week. We're going to do The Trial, the 60, 62, 63 uh, Orson Welles version. Right. And then we're going to do Naked Lunch, the 91 Cronenberg version. See them in that order and you won't hate us as much. <laughs> Watch more fucking film. Bye.